everyone, it's good to see you all in person. <clears throat> Please join us in some gathering music this morning. We have the victory. We have the victory. 
them and their ministry of song. This is a day that the Lord has made and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Amen? Amen. Welcome to summer worship at East Liberty Presbyterian Church. Whether you are here in the Garth with us, in the Garth Overlook Room, or joining us on Facebook or YouTube, you are welcome and we hope that something is said, sung, prayed, or preached today that will meet you at the point of your need and that will bless you and carry you through the week that is to come. Amen. Joining Pastor Randy and I 
in uh, worship this day, of course, is the Journey Praise Team, which we thank God for them and their presence with us today. We also thank God for our audio team who are sort of hidden and secluded away over there, as well as our facility staff that make sure that the building was ready and prepared for you to come to worship today. So we thank God for all of them as well. I'd like to share just three announcements with you today. This is a record. <laughs> My God. Three announcements. Usually there are like 25. Um, so families with children who are either in pre-K through the fifth grade are invited to participate in a special day of worship, exploration, creativity, and prayer at the upcoming um, kids summer kids ministry which is entitled sanctuary god is always with us now this will occur on sunday august 22nd in highland park and in order to register or for more information you can contact miss sarah at sarah h at coh dot net or register and there's more information on the church website elpc dot church today if you've ever thought about or are interested in the joining the EOPC Family of Faith, you're invited to stay for our inquirers class that will um, occur immediately following this worship. All you need to do is meet Pastor Randy in the fellowship room, which is on the first floor opposite of the Garth Overlook room, and learn more about what it means to be a member or a friend of East Liberty Presbyterian Church. Also today at 11.30 a.m., the LGBTQIA ministry will meet for a spiritual gathering, and you'll need to contact Will Forrest for further information. Will's here. I've seen him uh, bandying about, or you can email him if you have your cell phone at will at coh.net, and he will give you the location of that gathering. Those are all the announcements for the day. Praise God. So, yes. Yay. <laughs> Siblings in Christ, we have gathered in this Garth as well as in the Overlook Room and on Facebook and YouTube, and there's even a few folks who are joining us on Zoom, and we've come together to worship God in spirit and in truth, as well as to commune with one another. So as we continue in worship, as you are comfortable, I invite you to please greet one another with the sign of God's peace. La paz de Cristo con ustedes. May the peace of Christ be with you. Please greet one another. And I... Through this time of worship, may God strengthen us in our being through God's own spirit. And may Christ dwell in our hearts through faith, so we may be rooted and grounded in love. Through this time of worship, may we comprehend with all the saints the breadth, length, height, and depth of God's mercy, so we may be filled with the fullness of God trusting in the one who is able to accomplish abundantly far more than we can ask or imagine, we prepare our hearts now to worship our God, creator, redeemer, sustainer. Alleluia.
God's mouth came far and so Looked all around me, looked so fine So far as my Lord, if all was mine to heaven and then run back. Every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. Yes, every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. Every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. Yes, every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, People of God, scripture tells us that if we say we are without sin, we lie. We're delusional and the truth is not within us. Scripture also assures us that when we confess our sin, God is faithful and just, forgives and restores us back into relationship with God and with one another. So let us pause for just a few moments to pray and confess, first in unison and then in silence. Let us pray together. Triune God, shepherd of your people near and far, you provide for us more than we expect or imagine possible. To you we confess our sins and pray for your help so we can both repent and turn from evil. Deliver us from the temptation to hide from you, lie to you, or to excuse ourselves for the harm we have done to others. Forgive us for the transgressions done and goodness left undone. Send your spirit of renewal and grace upon us that we may truly be your disciples, your servants, your church. Hear now our silent prayers of confession. Amen. Beloved, Scripture assures us that God is loving and God is forgiving. And when we acknowledge our sins and repent, God forgives us and moves our transgressions as far as east is from west. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Praise God. So one of, the, one of the surest signs of optimists versus pessimists is who's sitting outside the canopies right now. <laughs> I appreciate all the acts of faith for you all being with us today and for those that are watching on the live stream. Um, if, if you're new to our congregation, we have two worship services, uh, primarily September through May, and the earlier service at 845 is our journey our gospel contemporary service, and so Michael and the Journey Praise team, David, Delena, Adriana, and Robin are here today, so we're excited to have them with us, and they'll be joining us at least once a month while we're outside. It is our plan to be outside uh, during the coming weeks up through Labor Day, so if you are able to come and join us, you can pre-register online and be with us one way or the other. It's also important that all of you have bulletins. If anybody's missing a bulletin, stick your hand up. I'm going to yell at Frank, and Frank's got some extras there. I think we're all right, but if you need something, Frank's uh, the stalwart usher chair, and he's uh, back there with some extras. 
All right, so for the last couple of weeks, what we've been doing is looking in depth at the last two chapters of Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, the first letter. And we're looking at the last words of that letter, and that letter was actually the first letter that Paul wrote. So it's the earliest Christian writing that we actually have. Paul wrote it around 50 CE, and he wrote it to encourage this young congregation, this fellowship group in Thessalonica that he had visited, established, but wasn't able to return to for several years. And so in the bulletin is the actual text. I want you to follow along with me. I'm going to read it and offer some comments on different parts of it. So the first two verses, verses 12 to 13 of chapter 5. Paul writes, But we appeal to you, brothers and sisters, to respect those who labor among you and who have charge of you in the Lord and admonish you. Esteem them very highly in love because of their work and be at peace among yourselves. All right, pause. It's only been 20 years since Jesus' death and resurrection. So many of the apostles, the people who saw Jesus during his own lifetime, Many of them are still alive and traveling around preaching and teaching. In 50 CE, there is very little formal structure to the Christian church. There are mostly fellowship gatherings in homes who would come together to remember the life and teachings of Christ, to share communion, and to pray together. At this point, there are no New Testament scriptures. There are no gospels that are written. And there are, in many ways, no official preachers or church officers. But in each of these communities, there are house group leaders and people that the fellowship could turn to for a counsel or advice or inspiration. So in these verses, what Paul is doing is encouraging the young fellowship in Thessalonica to respect whoever is leading their fellowship and support them in love. All right, the next two verses, 14 and 15. We urge you, beloved, to admonish the idlers, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that none of you repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to all. Now, I'll flesh out these verses a bit later, but basically Paul is saying, as a community, you need to work together. Now, some in that community were quite sure that Jesus was coming very soon, and therefore the basic rules and habits of daily life didn't apply to them anymore. Others were stumbling under the persecution that they were facing by being kicked out of the synagogues or being persecuted within the Greek cities. So Paul's hope is that they would all continue to be faithful and just, not persecuting and harming any others, but doing good and supporting one another at all times. Verses 16 to 22, Paul says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise the words of the prophets, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good and abstain from every form of evil. Now, again, Paul is just offering words of encouragement. Be strong in your faith. Rejoice, pray, even if you're facing times of persecution. At the same time, in these fellowships, there were people who felt led to offer words of prophetic wisdom, whether speaking in tongues or claiming special knowledge from God. But Paul is offering a measure of what I would call Presbyterian restraint. (laughs) He's reminding them, to test everything, to be guided by the larger witness of faith and not to succumb to false spirits or opportunistic prophecies. This comes up again in the later writings of the New Testament. In 1 John, we have the verse that says, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. All right, and then the last verses, 23 to 28, Paul says, May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. May your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do this. Now, Paul is returning to the theme of sanctification. That's where he started in chapter 4, this idea of growing stronger in body, soul, and spirit as you await Christ's return. 
Then he says, Beloved, pray for us. Now, the us is a reference to Paul, Silas, and Timothy. They had been there informing the church. They were now pretty much, we think, in Corinth, starting up the congregation that Paul would later write his letters to the Corinthians to. Paul says, Greet all the brothers and sisters with a holy kiss. I solemnly command you by the Lord that this letter be read to all of them, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. So last comment. Paul commands that this very letter be read aloud to the whole house group, to the fellowship. And so from this one line, it's the only time he does this, but we see this is how the New Testament actually came to be. That they saved these letters of Paul and Peter and John. They collected them, copied them, and then added them to the Gospels, studying on them as a group. The practice marked Paul's missionary career, that he would write and expect the letters to be read to all, but it's the foundation of the New Testament that we have today. And it's a reminder that God's word is not just for individuals to take and choose. It was always intended for a community to read and reflect on and grow in faith together. Thessalonica in 50 CE and Pittsburgh today. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you now to stand and join in singing the next hymn, which is the, the chorus, Lord, listen to your children playing. Everyone. Um, my name is Catherine Opart. I'm the seminary intern at ELPC. And now's the time for the kids of all ages to come and listen to the children's message this morning. So today's Bible passage talks about prayer. And prayer is a way that we talk with God or a way of being with God. So take a moment and think about and consider, like, what do you think about when you think of prayer? Maybe you think of bowing your head and closing your eyes. 
Maybe you think of folding your hands and saying words out loud. Maybe you think of saying thanks or asking for help. Well, these are all ways that we pray. But there's something really interesting in this passage that it says for us to pray without ceasing. It says for us to pray all the time. So now think back to what you were considering when you think about prayer. And imagine, I mean, if you were thinking of having your eyes closed and bowing your head and doing that all the time, could you imagine all the things you would run into? Praying would become a contact sport, really. Um, so maybe that's not really what this passage, <clears throat> excuse me, is talking about. Well, I think that when it says for us to pray without ceasing, it means that we can live our whole lives as a prayer. And this Bible passage tells us some of how we can do that. It tells us to encourage one another, to help each other, to be peacemakers, and to treat everyone with love even when they hurt us. These are all ways that our lives can be a prayer. Because whenever we do something kind or loving or peaceful, that's like a prayer to God that the world would be filled with more of that kindness, that love, that peace. So remember, you don't have to bow your head or close your eyes in order to give a prayer, though you can. But your whole life can be a prayer when you live with kindness and love and peace. So let's keep praying together by showing signs of God's love and peace. So now turn to your neighbors and share a, a peace sign or a heart or a smile. And may God bless our signs of kindness and love and peace among us here to go out into our community and around the world. Amen. So friends, on behalf of the session, I want to present Elizabeth Eleanor Wittenstein and Matilda Claire Wittenstein, the daughters of Emily and Nicholas Wittenstein, for the sacrament of baptism. I want to invite them and their, their parents and friends to join them up here at the baptism font. I invite you to hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always to the close of the age. Now this promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls. Obeying the word of our Lord Jesus, we baptize those whom he has called to be his own. By water and the Holy Spirit, we are made members of the church, the body of Christ, and joined to Christ's ministry of love, peace, and justice. Let us remember with joy our own baptism as we celebrate this sacrament today. So as you know, we've been playing catch up on baptisms, and so we're excited to have the Wittenstein uh, daughters with us today. So to you both, to Emily and to Nicholas, you desire to have your daughters baptized. If so, please say, I do. I do. And relying on God's grace, do you promise to live the faith and teach that faith to your children, do you? I do. Well, then we invite you to show your purpose by answering these questions. Trusting in God's mercy, do you turn from the ways of sin? Do you renounce evil and its power in the world? Do you? I do. Do you turn to Jesus Christ, accept him as Lord and Savior, and trust in his grace and love? Do you? I do. And will you be Christ's faithful disciples, obeying his word and sharing his love? Will you? I do. And now to the congregation. 
Do you, as members of the Church of Jesus Christ, promise to guide and nurture Elizabeth and Matilda by word and deed, with love and prayer, encouraging them to know and follow Christ and to be faithful members of this church? Will you? And typically we would have the children up here with us, but for the children watching or around, do you as children also promise to welcome Liesl and Matilda to our church family to help them grow in faith, hope, and love? If so, shout out, we do. We do. There we go. All right, Patrice. And now will you pray with me? You, O oh God, are the voice above the waters, thundering wisdom, flashing glory, showering grace. We praise you. You sent Jesus to give us living water, the cup of blessing, the cup of promise, the cup of salvation. We give you thanks. By your spirit, Lord God, make this water a pool of healing, a river of new life, a flood of grace. We glorify you. Keep us one with you in the way and the truth and the life of Jesus Christ our Lord. We praise you, we give you thanks, we glorify you, now and forevermore. Amen. What is your daughter's given name? Uh, it's Elizabeth Eleanor. <laughs> Elizabeth Elemo Eleanor? That's great. I baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. May the blessings of God, the love of Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit abide with you always. Amen. Amen. Hello, Matilda. <laughs> <laughs> what is your daughter's name? name is Matilda Clara. Matilda Clara. I baptize you in the name of God the Father and God the Son. That? And God, the Holy Spirit, may the blessing of God, the love of Christ, the power of the Spirit rest and abide with you and give you peace this day and forevermore. <laughs> may all God's people say, Amen. Amen. <laughs> so we welcome uh, Liesl and Matilda and the family of the church. We... <laughs> So remember your own baptism and be of good cheer for they are the light that shines in the future that we can guide and send forth to go ahead of us by God's grace and they are our hope and our joy. So may all we do celebrate the gospel made known in our lives and in theirs. Amen. Amen. All right, you may be seated. And our next hymn, which is Wade in the Water.
Amen. You may be seated. So I invite you to turn back to that passage from 1 Thessalonians printed in the bulletin. I'm not going to read it again, but I invite you to read it silently as a way to remind yourselves of Paul's themes as we prepare to reflect on it today. Let us read it to ourselves. Loving God, draw near to us once more. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I know nothing about Paul's stationery. I realized that I, I had no idea about the nature of the paper that Paul used when he wrote to his various churches, like the little church in Thessalonica. And so I did some research on the topic. Most letters in the Greco-Roman period were short letters, maybe 150 to 200 words, and they would usually fit on one sheet of papyrus, usually about similar to a, a notebook uh, in paper that we use today. Now, Paul, being a little more verbose, would need more than one page of paper. His shortest letter was 335 words, the letter to Philemon. His longest letter to the church in Rome was over 7,000 words. Now, I mention this because when we get to the end of 1 Thessalonians, it feels like Paul is running out of room on his paper. His sentences become shorter and shorter. He exhorts rather than explains. He uses imperatives rather than full instructions. But the point is, even if Paul was running out of room on his papyrus, he saved the very best for last. In 1 Thessalonians, what Paul is doing is expressing his love and gratitude to this faithful small fellowship. He's telling them, keep doing the good work that I know you've been doing while you look forward to the coming of Jesus Christ and the healing of the world. He knows very well this is a young church. He knows they're learning how to balance being led by the Holy Spirit and how to be an actual institution in that community of Christ's gospel. They're learning how to preach and teach and how to be an actual church, meeting for regular times of fellowship, worship, and prayer. And it's that tension that we see reflected in the end of Paul's letter. And so, with any group and group dynamics, Paul begins by saying, be at peace with one another. Now that actually sounds kind of general, so Paul fleshes this out in the next verse. He says, I want you to admonish the idlers, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with all of them. The word for idlers is actually a funny word. It's the only time it really appears in the New Testament. And it doesn't really mean someone that's a lazy bones. The Greek word actually means someone who's disruptive or perhaps 
a little bit disorderly. Think of a marching band. The idlers are the ones who are constantly marching out of step, who keep veering off course and throwing off the others in the band. Every organization, dare I say, every church has a few people who march to a different drummer, who make it hard for everyone sometimes to stay on the parade route. But continue this same analogy. If there are idlers disrupting the flow of the band, then there's also the faint-hearted in the group, the shy flute player who keeps their heads down, plays too soft, never fully joins in with the group. And there's also in the group the weak, the skinny kid in the back who's struggling under the weight of the bass drum. So we have the disruptors, the faint-hearted, and the weak. Paul doesn't want us to kick any of them out of the band. He literally says, be patient with all of them. Always seek to do good. So the image here is not of a strict drum major enforcing the rules, but rather inviting us to be that one who stays behind after band practice to make sure that everyone knows their part. It's calling us to be that person who helps a, someone balance on the bicycle when they're learning how to ride without training wheels, or to be the friend that can be called when someone else is struggling with addiction and facing a moment of weakness, or to be the one who encourages someone else to get out of an abusive relationship, or to be the one who helps a friend sort through clothes or downsize a house after a beloved partner has died. To be patient with all of them, though, could easily sound like superficial advice, and it's not. To do this well requires real commitment and spiritual strength. For us as a nation, it requires that we admit that our myths about America are not always true, that we are not a mixture of people, races, and ethnicities that have all merged into one big family. As Daniel Moynihan said almost 60 years ago, the melting pot did not happen. See, we may move around this country and we may share a common language of fast food restaurants and sports team rivalries and other cultural manners, but as critical race theory actually correctly points out, we have all been shaped by our past, a past that includes institutional and individual racism, a past that has had anti-immigrant, anti-black, anti-Native American policies. And it's a past that has followed us into the present day, and it still shapes our common life together. And so that's why Paul's words are so important, because they are both therapeutic, be patient with all, and they're transformative. Admonish, encourage, help the weak, faint-hearted, the idlers, the disruptors, who are there in your midst because they're part of my family. And why are we supposed to do this therapeutic, transformative faith? Because that's precisely the way God has treated us, and for all the same reasons. Now, the next little batch of verses focus on goodness and gratitude. And this is where Paul squeezes in a bunch of imperatives. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Always give thanks in every circumstance. We're all still navigating this long pandemic season. But Paul is calling us to be of good cheer in all situations, even this one. A pastor recently wrote that she and her husband had hung a map of the world on the kitchen wall. And they told themselves, let's throw a dart at that map. And when it's finally safe to travel again, we're going to go and vacation wherever that dart lands. She was happy to report that they'll soon be spending two weeks behind the refrigerator. <laughs> now, we need to face it. We can either spend all of our energy bemoaning the disruption caused by the coronavirus, or we can set aside time to reflect on what we've learned over this past year and a half and include the many good things that have emerged. Yes, there have been losses. Yes, there has been real trauma. 
but we are not defined by them. We are defined by our identity in Christ Jesus, who weeps with us, who laughs with us, who abides constantly with us. That's why near the end of the letter to the church in Philippi, similar to what Paul writes here to Thessalonica, he puts this in these words, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God, and the peace of God which passes all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. See, this is not something superficial. This is not a don't worry, be happy Christian bumper sticker. It's like what the author Marilyn Robinson has called a posture of grace. When we're faced with trials, we shouldn't just shut down. We shouldn't just become angry at the bad luck that's befallen us and close ourselves off. Rather, we're called to come humbly before God And to do it with a grateful heart for God's many blessings over the years. And then out of that posture, that posture of grace and humility and gratitude, then we look at what's troubling us. Then we look at what's broken in our world and our relationships. And out of that posture, we discover what comes next. What God's Spirit is calling us to do. How we're to repay no one evil for evil. How we're to hold fast to what is good. We combine a posture of grace with an attitude of gratitude. And in that is peace and comfort and abiding faith. Now, once Paul had written all these admonitions, written down all these instructions and imperatives, he finally slips in his best word of encouragement. And I hope it's something that you'll remember even for the rest of today. I was reminded of this phrase when I read how the well-known British theologian N.T. Wright wrote in one of his books that there was a day when he was ordained to the ministry. And on that day, he received many cards and telegrams and well wishes from people recognizing that special event. But one card stood out, and it came from a person that wrote a few words and then included just three small Greek words. Pistos ho kalon. The one who calls you is faithful. Now that's 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 24. And it's a reminder to us as individuals and as a church that Paul was sharing this word of hope with an entire community in Thessalonica. He has told them explicitly, read the letter aloud, chew on it together, open source its wisdom, grow in knowledge as you face challenges that day. But as you do so, hold on to that basic promise that the one who calls you, The one who called you together, who planted the mustard seed of faith in your hearts, the one who nurtured that holy discomfort as you grapple with racism and injustice and the world's problems, the one who whispered to you in the morning in that still small voice that you're a beloved child of a loving God, that one who calls us is faithful. In another letter, Paul said the same thing. The one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. Pistos ho kalon. Faithful is the one who calls you. It's that idea which is actually the true appeal of faith. And I mean that in both senses of the word. Paul offers an appeal, an exhortation, like at the beginning of this whole section when he said, respect those who labor among you. Care for the members of the marching band, as it were. Be at peace. Encourage, admonish as best you can. But his deeper message is to remind us that by living in this way, we discover the wonderful appeal of faith, the attraction that draws us to this gospel as a message of hope, of living water and life-giving bread. This is not the appeal of social media, 
with the Facebook fiction that tells us that by liking a certain post, that has a direct cause and effect bringing about positive change. Because it's just not true. At most, liking a post is nodding in agreement when your friends say something that you like. But in and of itself, it changes nothing. No sin is removed. No injustice is solved. But if we accept instead the appeal of the Gospel, we become part of something bigger that does correct sin, that does challenge injustice, that does offer peace in a world besotted with guns and violence and division. It's an appeal that's grounded on that belief from the end of this letter. The one who calls us, the one who brings us together, is faithful, steadfast. We're called to trust in Christ, the Lord of the church, the mother of the global family, the Savior who intercedes for us individually and collectively. And no matter how much room Paul had on the end of his papyrus sheet, at that point, he knew he had to end with that message of hope. Let it be ours as well. You are called, and the one who calls you is faithful. Thanks be to God. Amen. I'm going to invite us to join in a time of prayer, and at the end of which we'll say the Lord's Prayer together. Let us pray. God of this day and all of our days, you open your hand and feed us in due season. You satisfy the desires of every living thing. You are just in all your ways and kind in all your doings. On this day, we pray for the family of nations. We pray for those struggling, particularly the flood victims in Germany and China. We pray for those in this country who are faced with the threats of the wildfires. We pray for those who are alone or afraid, refugees, victims of war. May all your children have what they need to live in peace and harmony. May you guide us to be your ambassadors of hope. Loving God, we pray for all churches and denominations that we may find ways of cooperating together to care for this earth, to care for those in need, to together give you the glory in all that we do. There is strength in our common witness. Unite us into one choir of praise. Gracious God, we call to those who are in need this day and we ask that you would answer the cries of the hungry and those who are mourning. Be this day with Michael Warren's family after the death of his grandfather. Be with Bill Latshaw and his family after the death of his wife, Nancy. Be with those in the land of Haiti as they struggle to find peace after a time of violent change and revolution. And pray for all of us as we continue to battle the pandemic, seeking safety through being vaccinated, seeking strength in our common purpose and serving the needs of the most vulnerable, looking ahead to a future where we can resume our relationships and our gatherings in full confidence and safety. We pray for all those on the margins of life, for those pushed to the side by oppressive laws and racist policies, for those ignored by our own indifference and self-centeredness. May they be gathered up and may we find our place with them, that where they are and you are, we too may be and no one is lost. Gracious God, dwell in our hearts through faith. Strengthen us during the storms of life. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, unite us together, trusting that you who have called us is with us always. Hear us now as we offer the prayer taught to us by Christ Jesus our Lord as we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And I invite the journey team to be leading us in the anthem, I Surrender All.
to Jesus I surrender all to him I freely give I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily lived all to Jesus I surrender humbly at his feet I bow worldly pleasures all forsaken take me Jesus take me now I surrender all I surrender all all to thee my blessed Savior I surrender oh can you help me say I Amen. Having heard the word, read, preached, and proclaimed, may we be inspired to respond in faith through worship, service, and the sharing of our offerings. 
We are thankful for your faithful giving throughout this season that empowers our congregation to minister to our community and, and to serve them. Um, you can give online through the church website or here in the donation box at the back of the courtyard. Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you for accepting our humble offerings and consecrating them for the good of your loving and transforming ministry in our lives and communities. Please continue to inspire us to give out of that which we have received by your grace to those to whom you give breath may we offer you prayer and praise. And to the world, may we offer your truth. To those to whom you give strength and sustenance, may we offer our energy as vessels for your service. To those to whom you provide physical means, may we offer with joy and generosity our resources that may be used to care for your people and the creation we all share. May all that we say, do, and share be glorifying to you, O God of grace. Amen. Let us respond in song with the singing of the doxology. Señor esté con ustedes. The Lord be with you. And also with contigo. Levantemos nuestros corazones. Lift up your hearts. And lift them up to the Lord. Demos gracias al Señor nuestro Dios. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. O Creator God, source of life, nature, beauty and justice, we thank you for the abundance of the earth and your provincial care for all that dwells upon it. Make us better stewards of these riches. Bless these offerings so that we can follow where Christ leads and be guided by your spirit and the works of justice and mercy. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So our final song is the spiritual when the saints go marching in. If you're going to clap on the first and third beat, hold the bulletin and don't clap. <laughs> Otherwise, put down the bulletin and clap on two and four. Let's sing together when the saints go marching in.
Now, rumor has it there's some Rita's ice cream up in the narthex. Um, no one's waving their hand at me frantically saying no, so we're going to trust that's where it is. <laughs> so make your way up to the narthex of the Penn Avenue doors retreat afterwards. Also, if you're interested in learning more about membership in the church, give me a little time to greet some people, but we'll be meeting in the room directly behind this one, the fellowship room on the first floor for an hour-long inquirers class today. You have been called. You're not here by chance. You're not here by choice. You're here by a Spirit's leading and God's call on your life, just as you are. You didn't earn this. You can't perfect it yourself. And that's a great relief because the one who called you is faithful, will continue the work and complete the work. So be not afraid. May the grace of God, may the love of Christ, may the power of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with you and give you peace this day and forevermore. May all God's people say, Amen. Amen.